ਅਸਲਾਮ ਅਲੈਕਮ ਨਮਸਤੇ ਸਤਿ ਸ੍ਰੀ ਅਕਾਲ ਔਰ ਅੰਜਲੀ ਮੁਦਰਾ ਵੈਲਕਮ ਟੂ ਦਾ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਦਾ ਹੋਲ ਟਰੂਥ ਟੁਡੇ ਵੀ ਵਿਲ ਬੀ ਡਿਸਕਸਿੰਗ ਦਾ ਲੇਟੈਸਟ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਪਾਕਿਸਤਾਨ ਸਿਚੁਏਸ਼ਨ ਐਂਡ ਵਾਟ ਆਪਸ਼ਨਸ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰੀ ਹੈਵ ਆਫਟਰ ਦਾ ਲਾਸਟ ਫਿਊ ਵੀਕਸ ਇਵੈਂਟਸ ਆਫਟਰ ਪੁਲਵਾਮਾ ਅਟੈਕ ਔਨ ਫੈਬਰੂਰੀ 14th uh it seems that pakistan and india uh, has uh, managed to pull back from uh, um the brink of yet another war on and um, over and in kashmir for now at least a- a- appreciation is being expressed for pakistani prime minister imran khan and government for uh, uh, restraint and uh, mainly because uh, they returned the indian uh, air force pilot uh, wing commander abinandan uh, who was captured uh, when his plane was shot uh, down in pakistani administered kashmir on 27th uh, of february however when he was being handed over uh, on waga border uh, to cheering crowds on the indian side um the shelling was uh, going on intensely uh, on the ceasefire line which was a ceasefire line at one point but gradually transformed into a line of military occupation in jammu kashmir and there so far um, it is uh, the from the reports it appears that uh, at least seven people are killed on in uh, on the pakistani side uh, including two pakistani soldiers 40 people are injured and uh, 50 houses are uh, hit and uh, about 200 families are uh, displaced uh, they had to leave their homes near this uh, line of firing the same situation exists on the indian uh, side of this line where several civilians are killed and injured and houses are uh, damaged and some destroyed situation in kashmir valley uh has also uh, it remains uh, tense and uh, militarization is uh, uh, increased there with uh, at least uh, uh, 10000 more troops are sent there to join about half a million already stationed there and um, at the international level although um um you know the there is no uh, kind of um, big up roar or outcry but certainly from uh, various power houses um P- india and pakistan are asked to resolve the underlying issue of kashmir russia has offered mediation even and uh, another in another development uh, um, pakistan boycotted the oic uh, 46th session uh, oic is, is the organization of islamic uh, con- 47 islamic countries and uh, pakistan boycotted it because uh, for the first time the organization uh, invited india uh, to its uh, sessions as a special guest of honor so to discuss all that um, i have uh, today with me uh, dr natasha kohl uh, dr natasha is a professor uh, of uh, uh, international relations uh, at westminster university and she is uh, also um, a writer and a novelist she is a uh, author of a uh, novel residue and uh, the book imagining economics otherwise so welcome natasha ji thank you very much for joining us can can you hear me yes i can hear you okay uh, so first of all can you give us a summary of uh, how you um, view the events since uh, pulwama attack how things have unfolded and uh, how how you uh, see it i think that uh, can can you hear me and s- i think that it's uh, you know as somebody who uh, who has an origin from kashmir who's kashmiri herself and for the last uh, 10 years at least has been writing and speaking about kashmir this is extremely worrying since you asked me for a summary i think that uh, 
maybe the best way of uh, we are all aware of the specific uh, unfolding of the events and you know what happened after what so uh, really the the thing to note here is that this this has become yet again something that is about india and pakistan and about the points scored by the respective leaders in the two countries uh, but at this point i think it's important to realize that uh, india and pakistan both have a very problematic record and a weak um, a rather weak uh, case when it comes to the to to caring about kashmiris and uh, and to their long term welfare because the best way of doing that would be to resolve the kashmir uh, dispute which is a political problem and that is compounded then by the human rights situation now what has happened in the last uh, in the last two weeks is that we have seen and uh, of course an upsurge of violence but uh, the the nuclear war threat de escalation all of that hasn't changed anything materially on the ground for kashmiris it started from there two weeks ago uh um, just over 2 weeks ago and and it is today it is kashmiris who are uh who are again being targeted by say you know various other moves that have subsequently followed such as um from what i re uh, read in the last 2 days you know the the uh, again the the attempts to change the constitutional amendments the um my screen's gone i don't know if you can see me oh it's, it's okay i can hear you yes right uh, am i still on air yes you are you are natasha Please, so there's, so there's uh, so the you know the 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 attempts to to uh, to for uh, to change the amendment uh, to change the amendments to ban the the schools the, the to ban uh, jamaat e islami and you know and thereby increase its popularity but also put a lot of the schools and other you know other kind of um, charity uh, out aspect of that mm -hmm. and those students and all of the, those out of um, out of uh, the the help that they were going to be able to receive um plus i also read today about the decision not to give state ads to english speaking english language newspapers in kashmir uh, greater kashmir so uh, you know of course over the coming days we'll get to know more about this this response in kashmir but all of this is ultimately hurting kashmiris and i feel like ever more they're being pushed against a wall so it is very important for the important actors in india and pakistan to see the impact all of this is having on kashmiris and mm -hmm. i i say that this is not just a you know it's not just a moral point or an emotional point of caring about people it is and that is really important um, for obvious reasons but i think it also strategically hurts india and pakistan to continue to indians and pakistanis to continue with what is in effect a proxy war that has gone on for decades and uh, you know whether that is a violent war or whether that is something that in which the kashmiri population is used as pawn in various ways nonetheless it hurts the interests of indians and pakistanis themselves so i while i don't think it is irresolvable i think it is very much something that can be solved i think what 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 needs to then happen is to change the policy perceptions and the ideas of self interest that people have in in indian and pakistani establishments and that includes of course military uh, uh, you know military community intelligence community uh, political actors um, and this is something that that at this point is is it's it's worrying because the leadership you know uh, seems to be more concerned with their domestic audiences and in the case of india with the elections coming up that makes it especially problematic uh, because national security or the welfare of people or these sorts of things are not electoral issues the national interest is not an electoral issue in any sensible democracy so that is again i think uh, deeply worrying but uh, i think as as people what we must do and I, what i see myself doing is to keep reinforcing the fact that this does not help anyone this makes everyone more secure insecure the situation we are in at the moment and that the only way forward is actually to resolve the you know the kashmir dispute and to put the interests of kashmiris at the heart of any resolution hmm. so uh, do do you think that after the elections uh situation will change in any way or approach indian approach will change in any way you know if and, and will will that depend on who wins so in a sense that uh, i think that here we are it's i mean it's it's a perhaps counterfactual thinking is important here so if if we have the present government uh, return to power uh then i think there will be much less uh, much less incentive 
uh, politically speaking, for there to be any sort of um, move that would be about dialogue and deliberation and peace. Uh, because, you know, what we what we can infer about the future based on the past few years, that doesn't seem to be the approach that they are that they are keen on adopting. And uh, and and. And, and that would be even, you know, even more difficult because, uh, of course, extremists do not have a problem with any other extremists. And uh, and that's, you know, that's a fundamental fact to remember. And this is why we must guard that that ground, which is about, OK, resolution, which is uh, which actually does not continue harming uh, the interests of Kashmiris themselves. If, of course, uh, a different kind of government comes into power in India, which is, you know, either a coalition or some other party, then I think think that um, while things may not materially immediately change, while the discourse will not change in a day, but perhaps it would be, uh, you know, since ideas make sense and meshed with other ideas, I think it would be um, it would be more possible for people to actually draw attention to the harm that has happened. Uh, to the uh, insecurity that has increased and to the violence that has increased as a result of what has been done and and perhaps to be able to make the argument that we need to to do something different because it is it is very uh, foolish to keep doing the same thing and expect a different result hmm. and what options do you think kashmiris have now you know in, in this uh, persisting situation uh, well, Kashmiris are a very resilient people, and uh, you know, and I've always felt that that resilience uh, is important to remember. It is important to remember their humanity. Mm -hmm. It is important to remember that in the midst of you know of all of this, as it was unfolding last week, uh, people in in Kashmir Valley offered help to stranded Indian tourists. That uh, uh, so so there is that way in which I have faith in in Kashmiris. Um, to be able to keep making their point. However, uh, it is important to, I think, in my view, uh, a violent struggle against in that part of the world, you know, with the two nuclear neighbors and with a in, in such a militarized zone serves no one's interests. And uh, and, you know, and Kashmiri life is not uh, is, is not. Um, uh, is not so cheap that Kashmiri people and and men and women must just die and continue to suffer. So I think uh, it is important to find ways of building solidarities for the Kashmiris as they are doing already, and to keep putting their case, uh, you know, in at every uh, at every possible uh, public sphere uh, within the these countries, but also internationally to say that it is affecting them. And in that, I think the diaspora the international media, everyone has a responsibility. Hmm. But, but people who are uh, uh, kind of in, in, in favor of, uh, you know, what they are, you know, the, the militant organizations and all the, them, they, their argument is that, uh, and, and even some people who are not part of any militancy, but the, still they think that when there is no uh, armed struggle or no militant activities, then uh, India forgets about it, Pakistan forgets about it, uh, world forgets about it. But when something is done, like Parvama thing, then everybody talks about it. So is, is that not a dilemma? The, you know, the peaceful struggles are not taken any notice of? Well, peaceful struggles can bring about results that uh, violent struggles uh, may not be able to. It depends on the context. And uh, and I think that a violent movement, not everyone can pick up a gun, right? A militarized movement um, is, is tied into all sorts of other kinds of hegemonic notions. So in the long run, violence will not create power to use a Hannah Arendt sort of argument in the long run. That kind of use of violence, is, it may be effective in the short run. But, uh, you know, what is a short run mediatization if in the long run it makes the it makes uh, valuable claims of political and human rights issues seem to be simply about uh, existentially violent uh, actors motivated by religion. So I think that any sensible and strategic uh, uh, thinking of it from a Kashmiri point of view would understand that difference between a short run spike in global interest and which is then followed by a return to much worse state of affairs as opposed to a much perhaps a little harder but a much more important building of solidarity and a narrative which is non-violent and which puts forward a, a just you know a, a just cause for 
uh, for a resolution that is peaceful and that is in in other people's that is in the interests of indians and pakistanis themselves i think it is important to reiterate that indian and pakistani interests are also not served uh, uh, you know uh, by uh, by this endless war and uh, it, it and and that is something that that kashmiris have to do as well as uh, you know as well as of course have a, a much greater solidarity uh, within you know within uh, within uh, kashmiri um, within the kashmiris themselves to to be able to put that out and uh, none, none of this is none of this is easy but i i think that it is important for any struggle to succeed to be able to uh, to be able to a uh, claim especially in the international community as it is at the moment with the, all the issues around uh, globally around um, around resources around climate around the challenges of democracy i do not think that uh, that a violent struggle in any way serves the interests of kashmiris themselves uh, because it just enables greater brutalization just as support of non state actors in uh, you know non state violent extremist actors in pakistan hurts pakistanis that with with that and you know that terrorism is not in in pakistan's interest likewise the the brutalization of kashmiris in kashmir enables the banalization of violence against all sorts of other people in india so it is important for for people within these two countries uh, of india and pakistan to to recognize that and for kashmiris to be able to put that narrative out too i you know the in the recent events the uh, the people in india and pakistan who who spoke about the need for peace and not going to war uh, that you know that kind of that kind of voice as well as greater awareness of what's going on in kashmir i do not think that uh, you know that that these two post colonial states the citizens of these states are necessarily driven by the desire to kill and and hurt kashmiris endlessly i mean yes in some cases there are vested interests and you know political gains but i think that uh, the the thing about democratic consciousness is is that if people are made more aware of the of you know of what is going on and and that narrative is strengthened then i think that is the the way forward hmm. yeah by it's interesting that uh, the, you know the same groups which are uh, uh, declared terrorists and uh, which are seen as terrorists and now most be treated as terrorists by pakistani government are projected in kashmir on both sides as mujahids how how you how you analyze this well that has to do with if that has to do with the history of the last what nearly 3 decades so that has to do with the history of the last 3 decades of what's been going on and the way in which in a space where in the you know in the absence of political space that space has been taken up by militarized actors and you know so the military the militants and so on and and those are the people who have staked their claims in specific ways around kashmiris around um, around you know around kashmiris and they they've had to choose sides and and that has led to this perpetual vitiation vice, of kashmiri life and and i think that yes they are seen as that and that is the level of uh, you know and and that's telling in itself uh, when there is a battle between uh, indian security forces and uh, militants the villagers come out and felt stones at the you know at the at the security forces at the indian security forces so that is an is a, is a deep rooted level of alienation uh, and um, and and that is something again that it, it's important to for people in india for the establishment in india to understand that that level of alienation can perhaps be managed with uh, you know with force but not endlessly and that is all it does is create greater insecurity for indians for the region and of course for the kashmiris themselves so it is not surprising that those those people you know the the terrorists are uh, and freedom the terrorists are seen as members of terror declared terrorist groups are seen as freedom fighters but that is again a par part and parcel of the way in which the struggle has become uh you know has come to depend on violent actors which again i'm saying that that does not in the long run uh you know address or help kashmiris themselves um because every single cycle of uh, you know every single cycle every single uprising is then uh, matched by a level up 
of you know a kind of a, a, a level up a quantum change of an increase of br brutalities and uh, restrictions on freedoms and restrictions of life so in the long run what th what that does is that it just makes the population more and more um circumscribed in what they can do more insecure and their life just keeps getting affected so this is this is not in anyone's interests i mean last time the you know last time in india and pakistan during the uh Bajpay musharraf days last time it was something like you know that was followed um it was that moment of the post 9 11 moment right so but but those top but those top down things have to be i think let's let's try a bottom up thing let's try here with a con con uh, conscientious intent to make kashmiris at the at the uh, to put kashmiris at the heart of it and to and to build that voice really the kashmiri voice the kashmiri leadership the kashmiri narratives uh, of of the different uh, regions all of this you know no no um, no conflict is is solved until the framing and the ideas that are involved in that change and i think for kashmir that is really important the, the uh, one, uh, one one uh, uh, kind of arguments come from within the valley particularly that uh, there is no space uh, left for uh, peaceful politics indian uh, security forces indian state they don't provide any space uh, for uh, peaceful politics particularly for those groups who are you know generally called as a kind of uh, uh, though that politics which is generally described as resistance politics on that side and uh, so therefore uh, it is uh, they argue that it is uh, you know for, for common young people who have not seen nothing but war and indian security forces uh, um, you know make crackdowns and uh, killing people they have not seen anything else so how how they can kind of a shift to peaceful politics i mean how, what, is that not a big challenge uh it is a challenge it is a challenge and and uh, it is a challenge especially for as you say the generation that has grown up knowing nothing other and nothing different um uh, but the the uh, you know but the question here is that what what is the alternative and has the alternative uh, delivered any results for decades um, and especially the last three decades, even if you see, and can it de deliver results depending, uh, you know, in view of the global geopolitical alignments, the uh, the investments in that region, the in, uh, you know the, the 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 dominant perceptions of Indian and Pakistani national interests, will violent politics deliver an interest? I don't think so. Uh, deliver a result. I don't think so. I think it'll just keep on make. It will just keep on increasing the polarization to the extent that you know that the Kashmir cause, uh, which is which is about political rights and about human rights, will will you know will get to be seen exclusively as a terrorist movement. As uh, and that is uh, you know that is just um, that is a, a, a sort of a, a prelude to to much worse. I think that while this is difficult, it's important to remember today we have a world of technology. Uh, yes, there are numerous restrictions on Kashmiris, but it is much harder to limit voices than it would have been 70, 60, 50 years ago. It's it's much easier for for people to understand things, even if not phys if, even if they are not physically there. Uh, it is uh, there's a whole range of Kashmiris who are trying to draw attention to you know to what is what is happening and especially the youth through other kinds of things through um, through art through uh, through narrative uh, through other kinds of narratives and uh, and the use of technology for all of that. Um, see the conflicts. Uh, I always think back to say something like the the Good Friday Agreement, the Northern Ireland issue, and uh, you know no conflict is like any other. But I think the the key thing the key thing to moving forward is first of all to understand that the state of affairs as they are is not helping the you know the Indian and Pakistani interests because yeah, yeah. Uh, that that is the you know that that framing must change because strategy comes from policy and policy comes from perceptions and to change those perceptions we have to in, and internationally too think about how do we how do we create means of trust between actors at regional level how do we have processes that are credible processes of dialogue that are credible as well as um, as well as non-partisan it is important here that the 
you know that that this not be seen through this is why mediations are so hard if if you know if actors are seen as having uh, a having prior partisan uh, reasons or vested interests so it's important to have a credible non partisan uh, you know framework within which kashmiri interests can be placed at the heart and then an honest uh, you know dialogue can begin around the truths and reconciliations that need to happen for us to move towards a solution and uh, that takes trust that will take time but uh, but you know the, the the other route is is um, is just going to continue compounding the misery hmm. but one uh, major uh, i think hurdle or one uh, major dilemma or challenge is that uh, indians in position the government position is that kashmir is not a disputed one it's it's integral part of india and if there is any problem that is about the areas which are under pakistani occupation so in that situation how i mean when india does not even recognize that it is a problem how, how you know what, what can be done to, to make them uh, you know sit down and talk about it yeah so again they uh, you you know it is true that there's at the moment little political incentive and you know in fact the incentive is in the reverse uh, so so to continue with the militarism will will bring about greater results but i think that where there is power there is resistance and the uh, you know and the the that the, there have been so there is um, you know one can look at this through sort of like a purist lens but if you but there are nuances in that story there have been shifts in that position which have been you know more or less conducive at different points so this present post 2014 uh, position of course is a is a tremendously hardened position um and you know and um and i think it's it's part of that accelerationist discourse there were even people in uh you know in um, in kashmir who and elsewhere who thought that you know maybe if a strong man leader is in power then somehow the resolution will become easier uh in, in if anything it is it has become much worse the situation for kashmiris so there have been shifts and i think those shifts can again come about with changing narratives while that is the case that that you know there may be sort of like a position which is the dominant position but there are numerous indians who are also uh you know through creating creating knowledge and creating narratives that are trying to draw attention to why this uh you know why this position okay. is is not borne out by new, you know by a whole lit- litany of facts and uh, uh and and that's that's the the voice we have to amplify yeah. okay natasha we have about 7 minutes the time uh, when when you have to leave um so let's come to the the diaspora and international level one question about international is that uh some some commentators are uh, you know claiming that after this uh, tension between india and pakistan the uh, the kashmir issue has a kind of uh, um, risen in its significance and it you know it, it is becoming a priority uh, that it should be resolved and international even russia even offered that we can mediate if you want um you you think this will stay or uh, if war does not happen then it will be back uh, back to normal or uh, you know business as usual for for international uh, you know actors mm. so i think see the the diasporic question here is important because many um, many extremist uh, uh, nationalist uh, frameworks are strengthened by by ideological and material support from diaspora you only have to think about the ways in which you know that that sustenance was provide has been provided for uh, the the uh, the right wing ra- the rise of the right wing in india and there's also a contagion effect because that uh, you know the more communalization and polarization of indians pakistanis kashmiris in the diaspora is also not going to uh, serve the interests of the these citizens in other liberal democracies so that's the first point secondly i think it's important that that, that we are freer in some parts of the world than uh, than there where media tends to be very state centric so it is more uh, it is more incumbent upon us to constantly raise this uh, raise this question and to call out violent extremism whether that be uh, this uh, you know led by the state or by non state actors because that is part of something that since we are able to do so we should we must 
um, because you know the, the people there they are they are fed by this echo chamber of televisual hyper nationalist propaganda all the time so we need to counter that i think that uh, and as far as mediation is concerned um, you know china russia this whole thing all of these uh, developments as i said they can be the it's uh, it's not going to change very soon to to give a very short answer to your question like the summary is it's not going to change very soon but in order for it to change we must believe that nothing is inevitable i think that it won't we mustn't believe that oh well it will either this or, or it will either that it what happens will depend on every single person who writes speaks does anything on kashmir on their endeavors because uh, because ultimately we have to change those perceptions we have to change those perceptions and as i keep saying you know start from kashmir from the ground up rather than from the top down and build at a simultaneous level mechanisms for trust amongst kashmiris to you know to build that dialogue and at the same time more international voices where we have credible non partisan uh, you know within those spaces where we bring these voices together for people to think through uh, and uh, you know a solution which is not about the grid as it is right now and that will mean challenging you know challenging this idea that well this war is permanently profitable india and pakistan will never stop uh, their terrorism versus our possession i mean really the question is uh, the the liberation or the possession of kashmiris by anyone other than kashmiris themselves is to start off itself a hegemonic nation status project which ultimately you know is is about delivering something for someone because they don't know better here what is important is to look at the people who are at the you know who are as who are the part of that that region the kashmiris themselves of various kinds and people who are you know part of that dispute because they are part of the kashmir dispute and all of those voices need to you know there needs to be much greater dialogue between those voices to bring out that narrative which can then be used to to get as i said the indian and pakistani establishment state establishments understand that the situation as it is right now is hurting indians and pakistanis that uh, peace can be profitable too uh, that you know we what we've seen so far is the profitability of war for vested interests but we have to create that case of a profitable peace so that it is about the strategy and self interest of uh, of these actors in india and pakistan too in addition to continuing to foreground the way in which you know for the kashmiris themselves this is an unending war and it's it's a it's a it's a it's a war that makes everyone everywhere much more insecure yeah in last 2 minutes um can you see any um kind of uh, possibilities uh, of uh, having a sort of south asian diaspora uh, campaign for this uh, in, particularly in britain where it's nearly 3 million south asians are from india pakistan and kashmir are living so is, can you see any possibility of that that they come together and uh, form some kind of campaign you know to 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 support the uh, peaceful democratic struggle in kashmir and in um, uh, you know india and pakistan itself so um i think that uh, th that's um that i i'm you know there's we, we there have i'm sure there are various kinds of such initiatives so in a sense we don't have to reinvent the wheel but i think that um, that as i said before there needs to be a greater coherence uh, and an a framework within which this kind of process can unfold and and that it 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 should be at you know it should be about uh, the kashmiris themselves and of various you know from various regions but i think that it it helps if we have a more kind of you know uh, a more traditional backed uh, aspect to this as well in terms of of the international community back part of, you know understanding that this needs to happen because it gives credibility and i think that it's uh, and credibility and trust are a big problem with many with many voices on on you know who are speaking on kashmir uh, because of various reasons and and uh, you know and lastly i would like to highlight that it is important it, when we've seen this in 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 so many conflicts it's important to build build these dialogues with voices that include not just men and i think that is important they must include young people they must include women and they must include the the voices that are often seen as simply being affected by this 
as at the core of, of you know peace process must be these other voices uh, uh, you know because because that is the is the way forward to have voices of people who may not be who may not you know if how else do you stop a struggle that resorts to a gun for you know for uh, for demands that may be legitimate uh, but until and unless you counter that with making a with making those spaces inclusive enough for all sorts of people who who are you know who do not want to be part of militarized masculinist projects that are fixated on territoriality and not about human life so i think it's important also to if if these if these dialogues happen to have all kinds of of kashmiris as part of them in embodying all kinds of identity too thank you very much uh, natasha dr natasha kohl thank you very much for your time and uh, this uh, uh, was uh, Dr. Natasha Cole, and uh, you have uh, listened to her uh, views and uh, about the situation in Kashmir and uh, what are the possible way forward and what you know uh, how we can uh, work in the diaspora. And uh, for, for now, this is all we had for this show, and hopefully we'll be back soon with uh, another guest and uh, exploring other dimensions of Kashmir. Uh, question. Uh, thank you for uh, watching.